today, I want to introduce Vision Sunday because there's two parts to it, and uh, in, a, in one sense, and uh, and it leads also into tomorrow. We start fasting and prayer fasting Tuesday to Friday. We've got our morning here where half an hour will be just you doing your own thing. And this, if you've never done this before, you get this is a great way to discipline yourself and start. I'll put a bit of music on. It's my morning set, so um, it's from uh, DJ Phil and 96 point Phil and um, so Phil FM that's what I'm going to start my own channel and it's just a worship time and you can just wander around just listening to God talking to him then we'll come together and pray corporately uh, as a group and so that's going to happen from Tuesday to Friday and so be part of that and I'll talk about all of that this morning as we unpack it, all of that see Tracy um we 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 don't have massive prayer times together, but we're always praying together in spirit in the sense that we might be in different parts of the house or different parts of the country or city, but we're getting words from God for our church. And she comes to me with a word today, a few weeks ago, as I was preparing for vision. And uh, she said, I felt part of this year is overdrive. And so that's what I've called this morning, going into overdrive. And there'll be more in Vision Sunday about another part to it. But I want to start with this passage of Scripture in Mark chapter 9. It says in verse 25, When Jesus saw that the people came running together, He rebuked the unclean spirit. So the disciples had been trying to deliver a child. And this is what happens at the end. Uh, the people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Didn't just command him to go out. There's a whole sermon on that. But do not come back. Nick off and stay off. And a spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly because it, it was so deep inside his physical body and the spirit came out of him and he became as one dead, absolutely peaceful. And so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples go, man, this is really what they had, the, and they had the voice, man, sounds like Kuna and the kids, man, and um, little Mike Kelly, man, that's the only word, he got wow and man, 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 why couldn't we do that? Because they'd been out doing stuff, and they had been healing, and they had been casting, and Jesus said to them, just takes this great teaching moment in the middle of a supernatural occurrence, and he's, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I'm not going to get into deliverance this morning. I want to talk about prayer and fasting. When you pray and fasting, he is saying there is another level you enter into. The word for the year, as I said, is this word overdrive, next gear. Depending on how many gears you have, if you've got an old FJ40 or whatever they were from the 70s, great cool looking car, uh, terrible economy, they had three gears. I don't know how anyone drove around with the rattle and the bang and the ee noise coming out of those engines. Today, if you've got a truck, you've got, I don't know how many hundreds, it feels like there's gear after gear. Uh, got some gearboxes have got seven in your car and six in trays. So there's always this other gear that you can go to. You don't stay driving around in your lower gears. Now, if you are, most of you young ones who have no idea what a manual gearbox is, all right? It's how you really drive, okay? You are almost artificial intelligence as the car does half of what you need to do. But real people know how to drive. A real man eats quiche, shaves his head, and knows how to drive a manual, okay? And hates pigeons. That's another story of our demonic pigeons upon this place. How could they land on this building? That's, another, that's, that's a prayer point. Anyway, I digress. Where was I at? <clears throat> Okay, overdrive. So tell me to keep going. So there's another gear. But if you stay in the lower gears, sometimes you start off fast and you hit this point. You can't go any faster. You might even have a governor on that and it goes, and it just won't go. Your fuel economy tachometer goes up through the roof. And if you go too long in that lower gear, you'll burn the engine out. Overdrive makes you go faster, more efficiently. It gets you to a higher capacity with less work. It actually saves the engine from burnout and collapsing. And I feel like this is a word for the Lord for many that you have been in a lower gear 
and you're scared the other gear is going to be too hard. But if you do the right change in the right process, the other gear will take you into a better place to survive. The world needs the church in overdrive. It's gone back a few gears. You know why? Because it's hit some rough terrain. This is the Spirit of the Lord right now. We've hit rough terrain. So we said we'll drop back a gear because it's easier to go back and go slower than push through. And God says, no, I want you to go faster. But I want to take, not faster in physical effort, but faster in your spirit and watch more get done for less work in the flesh. So this is how we do it. Efficient Christian living. And Jesus, from a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, spoke and demons trembled and fled. So three things I want to highlight. Firstly, we need a revelation that we are spiritual beings. The supernatural is the first part and the most important part of our lives. The second thing I want to highlight is how to pray. That takes up most of this morning. And the third thing is that we need to fast. So firstly, let me just cover that. We are spirits and live supernaturally. We are spiritual me beings made in God's image. For Christianity to work, this needs to be a foundation truth. We've got to stop the thinking like the rest of the world thinks that we are physical first and maybe you can be a spiritual person if you're interested in certain kinds of things or you're religious. No, we were created a spirit and put in a body. In the Garden of Eden, there was a mannequin formed out of the dust. That's all you were. That's all Adam was, was this mold. And he had all what he ever needed to be human. But he was just a mannequin until God said, I make you in my image. And he breathed in him and he came alive. More than oxygen went into him. The Spirit of God breathed the Spirit of God into him and created a human spirit inside of Adam. And the Bible says, in the, we are made in God's image. If I look around this room, including myself in the mirror, when I do not think any of you look like God. I'd be really disappointed. If you look at me and say, I look like God, you should be really, really disappointed. There's not much about my human body that I say resembles God. It's not me, the physical thing that is made in the image of God. It's the real me, the spirit that I am that is made in the image of God. It is that which was separated from God and communed with God that created when sin came in. And it is that which is born again of the spirit. Remember John was, uh, uh, in John, Jesus asked, how do I enter heaven? He said, you must be born again of the spirit. Your spirit needs to reconnect with God. And it was a physical act that made that spiritual thing take place. Remember that. Spirit we are. Spirit is who we are. And therefore, Galatians says we, are need, to, we need to be living by the Spirit once we're born again and not of the flesh. If we don't live by the Spirit, we're actually going to burn out. We're going to try and do what God requires of us in the natural and you can only last a certain amount of time. Let me put it another way. If you have a car, and if your father or mother did not teach you that your car actually has an engine and has a fuel tank and has oil, what will happen within a week? I will drive it saying, look at my new car. My BMW is so cool. I am the coolest person on the planet. I've got a soft top. I take it off and I can drive around in my soft top. And that's what I've got. Look at my outside. Look at my physical. Look at my blue color. Look at my hair or lack of hair, whatever you are. Look at me on the outside. And guess what? One week down, the whole engine blows up. Fuel runs out. Push it a bit longer. The engine blows up. You don't change your oil or check your oil. Did girls, there are oil in your car, water in your car. Some of you guys need to know that as well. It blows up. If you don't know the real substance of the car is not what you see on the outside, but what is on the inside. Now, let's take that to another level as humans that are made in God's image. The real you is your spirit. And if your spirit is not born again, and if you are not feeding your spirit, if you are not living in the spirit, you are going to crash and burn. No wonder we have too much mental health issues in the church because we've been feeding the body and the mind and not the spirit. Now, let's take it to another point. Some of the stuff we do, but some of the stuff we do in the flesh actually will feed the spirit. It has impact. The Bible warns us of some of the things that we do to not do in the flesh because it feeds 
negatively in the spirit. The Bible says that to not be conformed to the image of this world, to Romans 12, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may know the perfect will of God. What is he saying? You are, you, there is an image in this world that is a, it's called the spirit of this age. And if we live physically and we live the mindset of this world, we are actually communing and relating to the spirit of this age. So there are physical things that we can do or not do that will impact the Spirit. We open ourselves up to uh, so much in the negative and in the positive by some of the things we do in the Spirit. We had a missionaries that we supported for many years, uh, Roger and Daphne Saunders. They came out of the 70s radically saved. They were part of some kind of uh, cult and um, hippies and uh, all those gurus that they used to have. They were on the news as the two I see of this guru that was collecting all these followers around the country. They went to, in, what is it, the places in the East Coast where they ha have their happy hours, their, but their spiritual happy hours, and uh, they all collected Emden or something like that. They, they had these places that would come in the 70s and, uh, where they would smoke pot, they would intercommune with devils, they would commune with spirits, uh, and they, they communed with all every other cult until they were radically saved. Radically saved. They were saved in the middle of this commune or this big conference uh, in the gold, uh, northern New South Wales. And uh, the, as they're saved, their whole tent is filled with the light of God. They have this, long story short, radical encounter. The following morning, every other person filled with demons has moved their tents as far away as they can possibly have. In that week that they're there, they are saved and then they give birth supernaturally to their first child. They were one of the leading components. You know, you, some of you are going to hate what I'm about to say. But they taught us where yoga was birthed. Yoga was birthed demonically. It teaches, it is designed so that you will allow spirit to enter here, to enter here and a few other places. The Bible, the people of our, the world now say yoga is just an exercise. And there will be exercises attached. But the birthing of that thing is supernatural. And we can comply with God's spirit or evil spirits by some of the things we do physically. The Bible teaches don't get drunk. Why? Because we open ourselves up to stupid behavior that will feed the wrong spirit. The Bible says do not enter witchcraft. What is that? Controlling somebody else by your prayer life. Prayer, physical, physical thing we do that is supernatural in its impact. Fasting physical thing we do that is supernatural in its impact praise you sit here oh, i don't like the music i don't like this. guess what you have just digressed from a physical thing you can do that has a supernatural impact and will change even the way you think worship brings the presence of god a physical thing we do that has a supernatural impact speaking in tongues the bible says it encourages builds up and it's warfare weapon that we have prophecy the bible says will build you up it will put a word in you timothy says then take the word that you have received and fight the good fight of faith with the word you got that is physical but it's supernatural and i want to remind us church we can talk about prayer and fasting and having church and buildings and worship and praise but if we don't understand it's spiritual guess what happens we wind up we we, we disappear we blow ourselves out it's just this thing that is happening and it's not working and so we actually have to come back to what is the most important. You are, this morning, spiritual. You are a spirit with a body. You are a spirit with a body and a mind. And it is the spirit where God wants to commune with you. And it is the spirit when we are open that we will hear from God. We'll get a word from God. And this will make sense uh, in uh, some more in a few weeks' time. So, supernatural overdrive, abundant. You know, the Bible says, I come that you, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life. And guess what? Overdrive life, abundant life. We can go around saying, I'm born again, I've got life. Look at my little mini, you know, 1962 mini. Uh, yeah, it's doing pretty good, but I can't even do 110 on the freeway because you haven't gone into overdrive life. So, supernatural overdrive. Abundant life comes when we pray and fast. I grew up in a tiny little state housing place, and, and I can share this morning, mum and dad aren't here. And um, 
in Wilson, didn't have, we didn't have much, and a similar kind of area that we have around here. And we grew up in a little house and the four kids, so we were sharing and there wasn't much place. My dad wasn't pastoring, so he, he wasn't, didn't have an office to go and pray in. So I had the closest room and I remember hearing him praying, interceding, crying out to God. I can't remember what it was, but I knew it was loud. He's always loud. And so I just remember these moments of intercession in the middle of the night that would wake as he would be woken up. And so that's how I was introduced to it. We didn't pray a lot as a family together. But I never forget the prayer life of my dad. And I remember a few years later, many years later, sitting with my daughter who was in her 20s with mum and dad, and dad started to pour out what happened in those prayer meetings to my daughter. And he said, I remember, because my parents got married pretty quickly uh, in uh, uh, both brand new Christians. I'm not even sure my mum was saved and they got married, to be honest with you. But dad was only a brand new Christian and they got saved and they got saved and World War III started. You know, it was during the Cold, Cold War. Well, they introduced the Cold War to their marriage. And, and Dad will say there were times, and this is his words to my daughter, which impacted her. He said, there were times where I cried out to God, I don't want to be married. I don't want to be married. I don't want to be married. And things like that. And in those moments, God had, Dad had an encounter with God. And he saw a diamond come out of the sky. And you have to ask him, he must be forgotten now, but I'm, I'm the record keeper, okay, for the family. A diamond came out and God says, you see this, this is what I see. Your wife is my diamond. And things like that, God spoke to him, that sustained him. And now what are they, married 60, something, 60 years? Because what? Prayed, prayed. And so I introduce that because this scripture tells you that we must pray. Matthew 6, verse 5 to 18. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is on the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard by their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore pray. This is a manner, not a prayer. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. I actually grew up saying that at school, in primary school. I learned it in primary school. This is the first time I've ever spoken. Of I've never heard anybody in the congregation say it. Normal is that we start to automatically say it. It just automatically comes out of me. So the word that I bring this morning tells me I'm speaking to the right audience. This should be part of your life. In fact, I'm going to speak to Helen about every Sunday morning that we introduce that back in the children's church. That's pretty cool. Maybe you as young parents may just suddenly realize, you know what, my kids may not even know that. It's a good chance because it's not something we recite in our lives anymore. So introduce it back into your life because you introduce the concept, not of the Lord's Prayer, of prayer, of prayer and fasting. And so, for if you forgive, here's, and God only, do, then Jesus explains only one part. If you forgive their trespasses, your heart, Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they will appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. There's a promise. There's a promise. Every promise in the Bible has a condition. There's your promise with the condition. So I'm going to run out of time. We're just going to pick some highlights here of this prayer this morning. The Bible says, when you pray. When you pray. Not if you pray. If you're a follower of Jesus, prayer is not an option. You actually cannot be born again unless you pray. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you shall be saved. That is prayer. Prayer 
is simple communion and relationship with God. That is it at its simplest form. We can complicate it and we can have all kinds of prayers. And there are books out there and you can do that. That's fine. But you know what? Let's just get back to basics and just pray. Just talk to Jesus. Just worship Him. Just commune and listen back. When you pray, just talk. If you can speak in tongues, pray in tongues. It shuts out the enemy knowing what you're praying about and takes it to another level. When you pray, it's an act of obedience. When God says, when you pray and we pray, guess what? We are actually obeying. The Bible says that when you, if you love, Jesus said, if you love me, you obey me. So if we don't pray, then we don't love him. That's not my words, that's the Bible's. So because we, we're not obeying what he says. So make it simple, come back to the basics. Uh, so it's a weapon as well. It started, God and Adam and Eve started their walk with God or their uh, communion with God. It was prayer there, just talking. We are born again with prayer. It's a weapon and a battleground. It's obedience to God's commands. So why do we pray? Because God expects it. God expects it. That's as simple as that. I know in our day and age, we need to know more, no more wise. You know, when I grew up, my dad would say to me, just do it. And I go, why? Just do it because I said so. Well, sometimes God can be like that too. I actually think maybe we need to go back and just, you know what? He knows what's best for us. If he says it, that settles it. Stop the why and do, the, do it. You know, it might actually help you a bit more. And he said, then the prayer goes on. Your father knows what you want before you pray. I love that. So this tells me it's not so much about what I pray. It's about the relationship. God's just wanting a relationship. I already know what you want and what you need, but I want to hear it from you. I want you to come and spend some time. I just want to hang out with you. You know, you, if you're here for the prayer meeting, you miss this when you're not here at the prayer meeting, but you'll see my grandchildren come running all the way down here. And Tracy will go, she'll be praying to you. Guess what? Here they come. And do, 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 all the way down the middle of the prayer meeting, smack into me, jump in their arms and hug and hug and hug us. And I go, I love that. I love that. What person doesn't love children jumping and loving you? And I wonder, where does that heart come from? From a heavenly father that loves the same thing. The heavenly father that loves the same thing. So he knows what we want. So it's, it's less about what we've got to pray about. It's more about hanging out and communing with him. And then he unpacks it a bit more by going, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the first thing is not God in heaven. The first thing that he says is, Remember, I'm your Father. Come to your Papa. When my kids run to me, it's Papa. There are no grandchildren in God's kingdom. Yeah? Every generation is a child of God. And so we come to Father. He's saying, that's who I am. First thing when you come in the morning, when you start, you just hang out with dad. Bring the stuff. Release the stuff. But come to daddy. Daddy loves holding you. Daddy wants you. Daddy wants to hang with you. And so when that is part of our, and it's not this ogre in heaven that's about to strike you down, because you have sinned that week, but it's a father that wants to hear the confessions of your heart and forgive you, it changes everything about your prayer life. There's less doing and there's more being. There's less action and more resting. And so we see, he says, the first thing I want you to do is go, our father, our father. And the second thing in that sentence, hallowed be your name. So there's another level. We come into the presence of the father. Daddy, I'm just going to chill. I've got a chair. I sit there with my coffee. and Dad, and just talk to him. I just want to tell you that you're amazing and I love you. Thank you so much. I thank you. And I, I get all kinds of things, but sometimes I get talking about me. You know, I thank you for what you've done for me. And, and then sometimes I've got to stop myself and go, do you know what? You made the earth. I need to be reminded that you are amazing. And it says, how would be your name? What are the names of God? Jaira, Rapha, Yahweh, whatever, know the names, that's who you are. I just want to talk about you. I just want to say you're amazing. You're awesome. And just whatever words, and 
Some of us can't. You know, if you've got another language, you're lucky. You can use multiple words. I'm battling with English most of the time. So some of you guys from Burundi and the Congo, then you can speak three languages. And I go, wow, that's three times as much you can say to God. And God's going, no, that's not wow, okay? <laughs> so you come and know Him. So talk about Him. But also this reminds us that God is, also, is dad, but he's supernatural, all-powerful being. He's the creator of the universe. So whatever you are facing right now, he is a name, he is a person, he is God that is an answer to whatever you have got in your going life. So he remind, wants us to be reminded that he is father that receives us, but he is God that heals us. He's father that loves us, but he is also God that destroys the works of the enemy. So we come with that and we enter into his presence. We pray because it puts God on the throne in our lives as we worship. And then the Bible goes on and says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. The kingdom is not yet to come. The kingdom came when Jesus came. We are reminding ourselves that we're walking around as princes of the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're reminding ourselves that the kingdom of earth is meant to be expressed. And we'll do a series on this in our Mar end of February and March, talking about the kingdom of God, what it means to live in the kingdom. Jesus says part of your prayer life should be that you remind yourself and you start to manifest it, you start to pray it and to speak it. The world needs to experience the kingdom, not wait for heaven to come when they die, because it won't come when they die. Hell will come when they die. The world needs to see the kingdom of heaven is here, drawing them into the eternal kingdom, and we need to express it. We need to show it. We need to pray it. We need to live by authority. The power and the words of heaven be manifest through our lives, the churches, and the community. We aren't praying for heaven and the second coming. We're praying for the kingdom to be seen on earth as it is in heaven. What God has declared in heaven, we call for them to be experienced on earth. So we prophesy, we pray, we expect. Last year I said it was a year of expectation. How expectant were we at the end? Say, so I build every year. Every year should be built on the previous year. Don't forget vision. Don't forget the word of the Lord. Build on. Go from first gear, second gear, third gear. I'm a, how long have I been in Christian mode? I'm into about 50th gear. I am a road train for God. 50 gears. And it's David here, David Weston here. David, how many gears can you get to in a big truck? 18. Oh, that's small compared to me. I'm 50 years, all right? There you go. <laughs> Actually, no, it's 45, I just realized. Um, so the kingdom of heaven, we declare healing and deliverance. We pray it. We read it. We pray. We worship for his will to be known. When you're praying in this time, you can be praying. You know, you can interrupt your prayer life and, or be part of your prayer life is the reading of the word. Incorporate them together. So you're actually getting a word, not a logos or just a logos, but even a rhema word in this situation. God, I need a miracle. Like I said this morning, God, what, when I walked in that hospital yesterday, God, what is the word for this child? And all I could get was gyra. Jira, and what I'm going to share in a few weeks, that God cared so much for dry bones. If He dry, cared for dry bones to come alive, He cares for living sick babies to come alive. And so that was my word. That's what we're going to pray. I encourage the parents. I support. I love them. But for me, that was the word. And that's how faith, where does faith come? Hearing a word. Where do you get the word? When you pray. You don't get it from somebody else. You get it when you pray. Anyway, I'm teaching a church to rise up and pray. Okay, we, oh man, I'm running out of time. Okay, give us this daily bread. This is where we bring our petitions. This is where we bring our daily bread, our daily issues, the stuff all of us face, every one of us. And if you're living a life of faith, guess what? You have more issues than if you're not living a life of faith. Is that a good promotion to following Jesus? Yes, it is because you get to see supernatural answers. Trace and I were walking last night. And, uh, and I just had, the, my brain goes, when you're walking, it just goes in weird places. And something triggered me and going, what would have happened if I had never gone into ministry? And I'm thinking about my old job and I'm thinking, oh, great money and uh, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know what? But I never liked it. It did nothing for anybody. It was just a, sorry, I've got two quantity surveyors sitting in the room. That, that's what I was. And I just, based on what I'm designed, and I just went, God. And then I thought about my life in ministry and I went, I haven't liked that too. 
There's moments, you might ask my wife, there's been moments where people drive me up the wall, I drive myself up the wall, I drive everybody up the wall, and I go, I didn't like this, and I didn't like that. But you know, then I started to remember what I've got to see, where I've been, and the supernatural presence of God. And I go, you know what? I know I don't like this all the time, but it's better than where I was. And I start to meditate on where God has taken me because I followed His will. Your will is different. It's your will for your life is different. Not everybody gets to do what I do. I don't get to do what you do. You might have had, you might have the great, best job in the world. That's where God wants you. But it was more about the journey that I experienced as I stepped out in faith and saw His provision. George Mueller was one of the great evangelists and also um, he was a coordinator of orphanages in Bristol, England. He lived from 1805 to 1898. He built five large orphan houses and cared for 10,000 orphans in his lifetime. When he started in 1834, there was accommodation for 3,600 orphans in all of England, in the whole of England. That's all they could accommodate of, orf of children without parents. While twice that many children under eight so it's seven or 8,000 children under eight were in prison while they only had 3,000 opportunities for orphans. And thousands upon thousands more were homeless wandering the dirty streets of the major cities of England. And into that, he brought Jesus. He was no, well known for providing education to the children under his care to the point where he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life he started his early life in sin even while his mother was dying he's out gambling and out, uh, out uh, whoring around and drinking and his mother laid at home dying that's the kind of man God grabbed and transformed his life he encountered Jesus and was transformed Muller never made requests for financial support nor did he go into debt even though he built five homes that cost millions in today, multiple, multiple millions to build today, many times he would receive unsolicited food donations only hours before they were needed to feed the children. Further strengthening, every time that happened, his faith in God. One testimony tells how, and those who have may read his life story, tells how while they were saying grace with no food on the table, dozens of kids, and next minute they heard a thump on the door. They opened the door and a bag of potatoes has rolled off a truck and landed at the door. Now that's a life of faith, all right? You think that's crazy? Well, guess what? What fed Elijah? Ravens. That's worse than a truck. It's not as bad as having pigeons. All right. I need deliverance from pigeons. <clears throat> Every morning after breakfast, there was a time of Bible reading and prayer, and every child was given a Bible upon leaving the orphanage. The children were dressed well and educated. Muller never even employed a school inspector and maintained high standards. Nearby factories and mines were unable to obtain enough workers because of his efforts in securing apprenticeships, professional training, and domestic service positions for the children old enough to leave his orphanage. What a man! You don't hear about him in the secular world. In 1871, 35 years after he started, there was an article in the Times that said 23,000 children had been educated in the schools and many thousands had been educated in other schools at the expense of his, of his orphanage. 64,000 Bibles, 85,000 Testaments and 29 million religious books had been issued and distributed while also supporting 150 missionaries out of orphanages. In 1875, at the age of 70, after his wife had died a couple of years before, he remarried, and then he started to minister for 17 years around the world in 40 countries in pre-aviation times. His sermons were translated 40 uh, into, over, sorry, into over a dozen languages. In 1892, he returned to England where he died in 1898 at 93. He was famous for his prayer life. He prayed every answer and every dollar into his ministry. He lived by the word, particularly where it says that with God nothing shall be impossible. And this scripture in John 14, 12, which is not on the screen, says, Verily, verily, so I, truly I say, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than those because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified and in the Son. And you may ask of me anything in my name, and I will do it. Not in your name, in His name. In His will, in His desires, in His word. Then God will do it. This is when we pray into the needs. Father, you issue, this is my daily bread. 
It's interesting how much Jesus requires us to open up before Him and enter into His presence before we bring our petitions. How often do we bring our petitions, the first thing out of our mouth is not, hi, hi Father, hey Dad, it's God, you've got to save me. God, I need this. How about we prepare our spirit and our souls to make the petitions without the whine and the complaint by talking about and entering His presence. Father, I love you. We sung it this morning. It's not about getting more blessings. It's just about, I've been so blessed. The fact that I have eternal life is the greatest blessing. I don't fear death. I do have not a scary of fear of death in my bone. There's sometimes I would go, please, Jesus, can we just go now? I need a party now. There's no fear. You talk to anybody in the world before my wife got saved, the biggest fear they have is death. Why? I don't know, but maybe eternity is in their hearts and they don't know it and they deny there's something to happen, but hey, why do I fear it? Because in every person, there's a void that needs salvation. Every person. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is where we need to live a life of repentance. The psalmist talked about it. He prayed, Lord God, search my heart, know me, reveal what needs to be repented of for softness, openness, and cleanliness. Full healing comes only when we forgive others. We can be born again and we still stuff we're working out, but until we can forgive others, the healing will never come. So he's saying, deal with it in your prayer time. If God raises it, Deal with it in your prayer time. Quickly, protect us from temptation, deliver us from evil. So we want to live victorious lives. So we start to prophesy, speak it. Mark 14, watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. So take authority as we pray over this stuff. Pray over your children in these times when they're no longer going to hear the Lord's prayer. They're not even going to hear anything about God except in blasphemy. So we pray, pray, pray. Pray over our children. Prophesy over your children. Do you have a word from God, a rhema word from God for every one of your children? Have you got one for this year? My wife, she does it for me. So we pray together. I get one for the church. She gets it for the family. And we said, that is our prayer for our children, our grandchildren, our new son-in-law who's not saved yet, but he will be saved. He's just pre-Christian. He just doesn't know about it. He is gone, man. He's gone. I have a word. My grandma, I had a word from a teenager. And she was the, not a nice lady. But she, we led her to the Lord in her 90s. I had that word for some 30 years, 40 years, whatever it was. Have you got a word? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know, when I remember, you know what I remember about this at school? So, so some of you missed out. I remember at school not thinking I was missing out, thinking, man, I've got to say the Lord's Prayer again. But now as I, I, now as I look back, I go, I was blessed. I got to say, and the part that excited me the most, all of a sudden, I don't know if it was because the prayer was ending, but I actually don't think it. I really believe in my spirit that when we got to, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It was like, wow. There was a statement and it was just like this. Go, God. I'm on your side. I look back and I understand this excitement as a little kid that would come out with that statement. And now with wisdom and knowledge and insight, I look back and go, yeah, there's something about that statement. That when I finish my prayer time in the morning, is there a praise statement coming out of my mouth? Am I going, God, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Jensen and I, I taught him grace a few years ago. He's forgotten already, except for amen. I go, amen, and he goes, amen. And so that's our little thing. But I just, I love this praise. His is the kingdom. His is all the power. His is all the glory forever and ever, no matter what the world will say. It is the truth. And when everything out in this world dies, He is still the power, the glory forever and ever. And the King, amen. So finish with that. Ask God for insights as you pray, as you speak in tongues. Go to the next level. Enter overdrive for Jesus. Click into another year. You know what, God? I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be fasting. 
I'm going to another gear. I want to go to another gear. Gear. I need something to happen. I want to know you better. I want to commune with you. I want to know your heart. I want to get Roman words. I hear other people do. I want to prophesy. I want to lay hands on the sick. I want your name to be glorified and made famous around me. Go to another gear. Four, give me five more minutes before I wrap it up. Because the next thing that is said in that passage, it says, when you fast. When you fast. Not if you feel like fasting. Not if you fast. But Jesus, with prayer, He said, when you pray and when you fast. I had one pass. Oh, it's not a New Testament. Well, excuse me. It's in the Lord's Prayer. So in that Scripture. If you want to go to another gear, if there's some habits and stuff that you need broken off your life, fasting is an essential part of your life. I still remember that as a young adult doing uni and working, that I would take Wednesday to fast. I don't, didn't get a lot of prayer because what I did was I'd go and donate blood. And then I'd lie because I have eaten that day, which I hadn't eaten that day. But we know when you're young and dumb and stupid, that's why they send 18 year olds off the walk. But I'd lie there, I did. I'd lie there, then sucking the blood out of me. I go, Lord. And I think about his blood washing over me. And I just have this moment with him. I do not recommend it, please. I'm not saying that. I did a lot of dumb things. If you want to hear about them, I'll write a book about them. And I'm st- I shouldn't be alive today. Many others shouldn't be alive today by God's grace. But, but the point is, I learned to do one day fast that day, that time. Um, I then, when I needed a major change in our lives in 1997, God's calling me into ministry. I did my first three-day fast. Went away in the bush and it was the most miserable time. Fortunately, no one else was around me except for my dog, which I lost because I kept abusing it. And I was just upset. I was, this is stupid. Whoever designed this kind of thing, God, I don't understand you. But it's a spiritual thing. And my flesh is always going to war with a spiritual thing. Settle that if you're going to fast, it's not going to be comfortable. All right? Because your flesh doesn't want you to do what the Spirit does. But you're going to have encounters. It might not be in that first day. It might not even be the second day. It wasn't even in the first half of the third day until one moment I was lying there on a, in the bush. I said, God, this sucks. I've sung badly. I've listened to worship on a cassette recorder in those days. I read your word. I journaled. But God, I need an answer. It was about going with. And God, all of a sudden, Three things, bang, bang, bang. They all happen within a month. Has that happened all the time? No. It's always sucked. Fasting has never been easy. And I've done all of them. But it's a necessity if I want to live in the next gear. And the the Bible says, and you're saying, well, you should be talking about it because the Bible said don't talk about it. Well, the Bible does talk about it. We know Jesus fasted for 40 days. There's dozens of fasts throughout the Bible that is talked about. So it's not about you keeping it private. You can't keep fasting totally private. When someone invites you to dinner and you sit there and you don't eat what they put in front of you, you're either going to be a really, really, really rude guest or you've got to say, I'm sorry, I can't. I've already been in a season of fasting because I've got a wedding in the next two weeks and that sucks. So I've done my fasting preempting that, knowing I wanted to be part of this whole season so for most of January we've been a season of fasting to hear from God for Vision Sunday so it is a struggle but what he is talking about is the attitude and the focus when we fast fasting becomes quite intimate and personal social media is not the place to draw attention to our fasting yeah hey man look at me look how skinny I am now look at my face look at Oh, man, this is tough. No, no, get off it, guys. Fast it. Shut it down. Get intimate with God. It's about you and God. So we start tomorrow. Jensen Franklin, I love listening to his word, and I've read his books. He's got great churches in America. He's got a um, a, a whole book on it, and he's got a website on it, uh, pages on, on fasting more, and have a read of that. I've done preaching on it in our YouTube channel. It's the denying of food to sharpen our sensitivity to pray and hear from God. It's not manipulating God. <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah, I'm going to fast and God's going, well, you can't outfast me. I haven't eaten for ever. <laughs> and you think that 40 days is cool? Hey, guess what? 
try truly and true in years, I'm always going to win. So it's not about manipulating God. I've never thought of that concept before, but it's not about manipulating. It's about knowing God, sensitivity to God, to be intimate and hear His voice. Through the Bible, great things happen when people turn to God, fasted and prayer, breakthrough answers. Jesus started His ministry with a 40-day fast. He said, I'm not going anywhere or doing anything for God, my Father, until I have fasted. Now, we're not commanded to or do that, all right? But I'm just showing you the examples. The upper room, 10 days, fasting and praying, and the Holy Ghost fell. It develops breakthrough, answers and intimacy. Character in your body, soul and spirit is developed. Solutions are found. Intimacy developed and God's power is released. You become a conduit of blessing. You hear, I don't know why I said we're spiritual because I can't explain it physically. There's something supernatural and spiritual that takes place. When you walk into a room and you just go, Jehovah, Jehovah God, and then and, and, and you go, three weeks ago, would I have been that sensitive to hear that or would I have been overwhelmed with emotion? When you're discussing your future, getting married or your careers, take time out to fast and hear God. Ministries are started or redirected or re-energized in fasting. So he understand he, this. Build up your fasting. Do not start 40 days tomorrow. Please. I implore you. I can't command you. But as close as I can, do not start a 40-day 40, 40 fast. I've done one in my life. 40-day fast requires preparation. And you don't do it unless God tells you. That is a big, big call. And if you've never done more than multiple days, start and build up. And make it a lifestyle of fasting. You might start with a day every week over the next two. You might start with two meals a day for the rest of it. You might go to Daniel and do just vegetables and unprocessed food. Do something that you, but get started. And when you're fasting those meal times, pray. Sit down in your room, put some worship on and just say, God, our Father, hey. You know, you know what? Sometimes I've gone our Father and that's it. I've gone no further. It's like, I want to talk to my dad. I tell him I love him. I just, it's just a powerful moment. And you just build your way. Will it be easy? No. But it's spirit battling with flesh. The flesh battling with spirit. And pray when you should be eating, especially if it's a mealtime fast. One or two meals that you work it out. I'm not into this. So social media fast is good, but don't replace food. There's no social media in the Bible. It's always fasting food, okay? So don't cop out and say, I don't need a fast food because I'm not going to watch TV for three hours a day. Or I'm not going to turn on my phone. Well, that's not the fasting. That's just doing the right, smart thing. That's living smartly. But I encourage you to do that anyway. All right? When fasting and praying, use your heavenly language. It will focus you and build you. It's a powerful tool. that, And when you pray in tongues, think of what you're praying over. As you pray in tongues, you're praying into that object or to that person. So to wrap this up, this is what, I try to keep this as simple as possible. On the screen should be what we're praying for as a church in the next two weeks. And, okay, if they can come up. There we go. Thank you, team, for putting that together this morning so quickly. Basically, revival in Australian church, including us. A revival, we, want, we talk about revival in Australia. It starts in the church. The Holy Ghost fell upon the disciples before they went into all the world. So it starts in us. So in this time that the church is revived, comes alive, a fresh outpouring of His Holy Ghost upon us, that there is a national repentance and turning to God, that we see salvation and healing, and there might be personal stuff or people that we want to see that pray for an increase, pray over your family for these things. Pray for our missionaries that you know in the Kimberleys in Thailand, Cambodia, and Ophelia. You might have others that you know. And there might be nations that God will put on your heart. Pray over them and they drop into your spirit. And then, of course, there are personal stuff that you need to pray over. So bring that. That's really simple. It's just really, really simple. I'll, I'll, we will text Dan will text us out to the whole church. To, this is how we just, 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 we need revival. We need national repentance. We need salvation and healing. We need our missionaries who are out there doing it. And whatever's on your heart. So I try to keep it really simple. In 
and interviewed George Mueller towards the end of his life, asked how had any, was asked, had any prayer not been answered? And he said, no. No prayer had never been answered. Now, he didn't unpack this anymore because I think we all get answered to prayer. But sometimes our answer is no. Should I marry that person? No. Should I marry that person? No. God, when are you going to answer me? No. I've already answered you. Should I take that job? No. Should I take that credit? Should I invest in that? No. God, when are you going to? I've already answered you. All right? So if you're going to be transparent and honest, the flesh is wrestling with your spirit. You're hearing it in the spirit and your fleshly desires for money, God, girls and glory is wrestling against those things. So he does answer. So let me finish this. And he said, always answered, he said. They said, surely one must have not been answered. What about current prayer you have? He said, I'm waiting for one to be answered. And it will be. Why could he be so sure, they asked. How could it be any other way if I'm still praying? How could God not answer if I'm still praying? His Bible says he will answer. And so he lived by the Word, by faith, and by prayer. And here's the funny point, cool point. That prayer that was still unanswered was for a friend's unsaved son who gave his life to Christ at George Mueller's funeral. Every prayer answered. We just got to be transparent, honest, and hungry. And this is a lifestyle. It's not a flash in the pan. So as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I just want to, like this young man that was saved in George Mueller's, the Bible says that all of us somewhere have to encounter God where we do it in eternity. If we haven't done it before then, then we're, our destiny is hell. But on earth, we have this chance to believe in our heart, repent with our mouth, and you shall be saved. To know the living God. And what happens in a meeting like this, if you don't know God or if you've fallen away and backslidden or you're not sure, that your spirit will start to bubble inside. Something inside of you will be calling you. I've got to do something. The, the sermon may not even be have been appropriate to where you're at in life, but God is here and He speaks to you spirit to spirit. And so He's talking to you tonight, this morning. And so I'm asking the question this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? If you don't, if you're backslidden, you're not sure, or you've never made that decision, listen to what the Holy Ghost is saying into your spirit right now, the real you, saying right now, and say yes to Him. He's calling you to repent and receive His forgiveness and His life and His abundant life. So if that is you this morning, say yes to that call that's going on inside of you. And would you just lift your hand so I can pray with you? Talk to you after. I'm not here to embarrass you this morning. Anybody in this room, you know, you either need to come back to God. You need to come to Him in the first place or you need Him right now. Anybody in this room, if you brought someone, it's a good time to just say, is this you? Is this you? God is talking to you right now. Let's all stand, shall we? Could you, and we'll all say this prayer after me. And this is so, if you have not made that decision, that you do make it together now. And let us know afterwards that you prayed this and meant this for the first time, or even the multiple times, but you, this is your moment with God. So let's say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner that needs saving. I repent of my sin. I ask forgiveness. Come into my life today, this hour. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, your mercy, your kindness, and your salvation. I am your child. Amen. The repentance in your heart and uh, in your mouth and the belief in your heart, you are saved. You are saved. You are a spiritual being that God wants to speak spirit to spirit. Start to listen. And as we make this call, when we start to pray in prayer meetings and other meetings, and tonight at 5.30, there'll be a praise party with prayer in it. At the beginning of 2023, God wants His church to go to another level. He wants to, to be the church that it was created to be. 
not, and it's not about who stands here and can preach the fanciest or do the funniest things. It's about the church, you and I, going, changing gears, changing gears. You and I are getting it. You and I, I'm, I'm just, I just got a different job than you. That's all it is. You and I getting a passion for God again. You and I prayer and fasting. You and I hungry for Him. That's what changes the world. And so I pray this over you right now. You can put your hands out like this. It's not the, uh, to receive or like this. And I don't care anyway you want to do it. 1 Thessalonians 15, this is, this is what, how you're going to do this season. 16, 20 says, Always rejoice, church. Constantly pray, church. In everything give thanks, church. For this is God's will for you and Jesus. Do not extinguish the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but examine all things. Hold fast to what is good and stay away from evil. Amen. Amen. We're not going to get another song. I've gone over time, tried to squeeze so much in. I got blood out of a stone in that one, didn't I? But we're going to dismiss the service tonight at 5.30. We've got um, our night, first encounter night for the year. From now on, they're here on every night. But for anyone that needs prayer, that wants to, someone to stand with them in this hour, we're going to pray always. Pray always. We'll pray with you in whatever situation you are. So you can come at this time. But over you right now, I just pray, God, a fresh revelation that we are spiritual, supernatural beings. And in this house today, we'll walk out of this place listening to your Holy Ghost. Father, denying the flesh to hear the Spirit. Father, lead us and guide us this week. Let habits be broken. Let uh, demonic uh, attacks be crushed. And let the blessing of God be released as we respond to your Spirit and crush the flesh in Jesus' name. Amen.